Hi everyone, uh, thanks for joining me today. This is going to be a fun one. Um, I meant to cover this more in depth earlier, but I wanted to make sure that I had enough uh, good examples that I can show, not just tell. Um, and I wanted to make sure that I had a good outline so that I was thorough, um, so that it can be really used as a resource. Uh, I don't want it to just be entertainment, I want it to be something that you can take away. So we're going to talk about counterfeits today, uh, and by that I mean we're going to talk about how legitimate cards are supposed to look. Um, Magic's been around for a while, there have been a lot of changes in the, in the printing process, but overall you can spend some time looking at real cards and get a good feel for what they ought to look like. Um, and that's really what we're going to do here today. We're going to look at some things under magnification and things like that to give a general impression of what you can do, how you can learn to uh, do some basic authentication for yourself, because a lot of the fakes out there are really bad. Some of them are really good, and that's why I'm around. Um, but uh, a lot of these you can kind of eliminate just by understanding how the printing process works and um, spending some time looking really closely at things and paying attention. And if you can do that, then you can save yourself from spending a lot of money on something that isn't real or maybe help somebody else at the local shop. So um, anyway, before I get too far into it, I want to give a couple of thanks. Um, my friends Caleb Woodward and TC Sisson who um, have helped me out and supported me through this and uh, lent me some fakes that they've found so that I can use for comparison purposes, as well as uh, Mike at Edmund Unplugged, a great local game shop, um, gave me uh, a lot of fakes that they had found um, and have really supported me through this. They, they have my business card up by the register. And uh, Daniel at Got Games, uh, good guy, great job. Um, also supported me a lot through this this process as well. Um, but anyway, um, before we get too far into it, the first thing I want to encourage is uh, actually not information from me, uh, but before you get too far into it, you might even want to stop this video and, and actually look at this article here. Uh, my, my buddy uh, Jason over at MisprintedMTG.com, another, uh, just a pillar of the misprint community, um, made this extremely useful and informative article um, on how magic is made uh, with some great visual guides. Um, and it, it goes all the way from design and layout to printing, cutting, corners, and packaging. It's not that long a read. As you can see, it's just a single page. And then there's a couple of really cool videos here that you absolutely should watch because if you understand that, um, then everything I say coming up will make a lot more sense. So this might be a good time to pause and just go read that lovely, lovely article um, and come back with a little bit more information. All right, I'm now assuming that you've gone and uh, read that lovely resource. Um, so moving along, um, so we wanna talk about the offset printing process. If you read that article and watched those videos, you'll understand a lot better how it works. Um, you'll understand that, they're, that each layer, each color layer is a separate pass and that they are halftone angles Halftone dots presented at different angles that uh, create a more pattern. And that's the rosettes that people talk about when they talk about the rosette test. You're looking for not just any pattern, but a specific more pattern that is created by those specific angles and such. Um, now, not all magic cards are made that way. So we're going to start off with, with an exception because unfortunately, this whole thing is full of exceptions. So I'm actually going to pull out my fourth edition and alternate fourth edition cards because 
there are all kinds of exceptions. Now, how do you know alternate fourth from fourth? Let's see if I can see this. Um, the dark corner on the A there is alternate fourth. These were made by the U.S. Playing Card Company. Um, it's not entirely known if it was, I think it was probably a, a test that was ordered. But anyway, it was an abandoned project, essentially. But the, the big thing here is we're going to look at two different types of printing. So we're, gonna, we're going to enable my microscope here. I've got just a basic USB microscope. Let's move that into a better spot. And so this is a mountain. Now let's adjust that a little bit. I like mountains. That's what I collect. So this is just a cheap USB microscope I got on Amazon for something like 25 bucks. Here you can see, just I mean, this way, <laughs> um, those are the rosettes that everyone is talking about. Now, a, a few things that you'll notice here. Um, up here, you'll see the actual rosettes, and then you go down to about here, and this spot, you don't have black, that's just magenta and yellow. And you, you notice you don't have a full rosette pattern, you just have kind of alternating dots. That's what happens when you're missing certain color channels. And as you go further in, um, you notice that there's white in the M of the mountain. That's where it's not printed or where you've got teeny tiny little dots. Anyway, so this is a fourth edition mountain. Very basic. Now, if we look at the alternate fourth mountain here, these are not rosettes. This is a different printing process known as stochastic printing. Um, now, when you've got your standard offset printing, there's two ways that you kind of can express darker and lighter color. One is the way that Wizards uses, and Card Monday, is thicker or thinner dots. That's called dot gain. The other way, and one of the ways that you can tell is probably a fake, is if they're using the other way is the, that the dots are all the same size, but they're closer or far, closer together or farther apart. In that case, it doesn't create a, a, uh, a consistent uh, more pattern. It varies based on how close together or far apart the dots are. But back here to this stochastic printing, it sure does look wild. Um, it's more of a randomized, uh, not really randomized, more of an algorithmic kind of pattern um, where there, you kind of see sort of a pattern, but it's more squiggly. Anyway, this is not necessarily, uh, if you see this, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's fake, but if it's not fourth edition and it's using this printing process, you need to be a little skeptical. I don't want to spend too much time on that because we have a whole lot to cover. Um, the other thing that you need to be aware of, and this is unfortunately just, you just kind of have to know. Uh, one, one easy way to know is um, there are a lot of variations in supplemental product. The reasoning on that is that most of the cards in previous history, now they've uh, changed this up somewhat recently. Traditionally, most of the cards uh, made in Magic have been made by Cardamundi. That's their big, big print shop. And Cardamundi has uh, originally big U.S. and Belgium shops. Now, um, for example, there were variations, normal variations in Mirage Block, and I think also in Tempest Block, uh, between U.S. and Belgian printings. I don't have any offhand to show you here, but basically um, slight variations in how, uh, how uh, dark the magenta was. So you might have some that are deeper red and some that are less red. Um, now, oh, and I meant to grab an example, which I think I have here somewhere. Give me just a moment. 
Maybe I'll actually cut this video. I tried to do these in one take, but I failed this time. I had to go find these um, on the subject. So there are noticeable differences here in the uh, printings between the U.S. printed English and Japanese printed English um, basic lands in Midnight Hunt. You can see that this one here is considerably darker than this one here. Um, we had, and I'm, I'm an admin in the, the misprints buy sell trade uh, group on Facebook. I can't tell you how many times we've had these um, submitted as as misprints. They are not misprints; they are normal print variations. Um, some other examples of this um, are things like dark visions, where you know if you com compare with a normal artifact. Now this isn't normal artifact from the same set. Um, and as a side note, when possible you want to compare things with the same set. This is pretty close to what uh, artifacts in that set should look like. And so you see there's a significant difference in the uh, darker darker artifacts there. But Dark Visions was kind of a known short run of Visions that was just darker than the rest. And this one's actually pretty cool because it's got this print on the back too. That one's for sale. Um, and then you'll see things like this one looks very sickly green. This was just this is actually a misprint, um, but you'll sometimes see lighter variations. For example, if I pull out of my misprint burn deck. Oh goodness, did I shuffle? I think I shuffled in my sideboard. That's not great. <laughs> oh, there they are. But we have an example here of the light print Monastery Swift Spear. Again, a misprint, but you'll you will see variation sometimes, and it sometimes requires it to be very, very different in order for it to be considered a misprint. This one is, but some are just variations because you can predict um, based on where it's coming from. You can look on the back of your Midnight Hunt pack. Uh, and I can't remember if which one was dark and which one was light, but I actually, if you look at other videos in my channel, you can see us opening some up and we can predict it based on where it was coming from. Um, okay, so where were we? We are on printing variations. Um, some other things that are notable, uh, for example, let's see if I've got my Uncle Myers. Here we go. Um, now these, for example, are a uh, couple of fake Verdant Catacombs and a real one. But uh, there is a known variation from the, I think, 12th edition um, pre-constructed deck that had the vampires in it that just happened to have a Verdant Catacombs in it. And that Verdant Catacombs has a different uh, printing around the expansion symbol and I think in a couple of other spots. And if you don't know that that's the case, then you might falsely identify, you might have a false positive and think that it's it's a fake. But think of, in general, you want to keep in mind, was this card in a pre-constructed deck? Was it in supplemental product? Now you're uh, back on track. Your supplemental product is often printed at a uh, uh, other print shops that are uh, contracted out, such as um, a Shepherd Porman, in some cases, uh, for example, in, in Ice Age, uh, there were some legitimate cards printed at Shepherd Porman that had black cores instead of the standard blue core. Those are real cards. They were printed by Wizards of the Coast at a contracted location. It just wasn't made with the right materials. You've also got variations like the... Um, the double-faced cards from Ixalan Block that were uh, that didn't have the core because they were made on the token stock instead of the regular card stock. Um, there's a lot of examples of that, uh, but think of was it in a precon? Was it supplemental product, or is it a known thing that kind of happened? 
you may not know all this offhand. You can always message someone who's spent way more time than necessary <laughs> trying to figure that out. Um, let's talk about common tests. Um, we already looked under magnification once. We know that magnification is a big deal. Um, there are a few different ways that you can do that. Um, having a USB microscope uh, like this is a great way to do it because you can also take screenshots straight from it and um, you know post directly on, on the web from there. Uh, you've also got the option of using, and you should, if you do this a lot, you should have one of these little jeweler's loop. This one uh, you can get for about eight bucks on Amazon or eBay or wherever. Um, where did my other one? I've also got a pocket microscope that I keep in my bag, and that one was only about 25 bucks, also on Amazon. Um, really handy to have those. There are other things. Um, I'll show you one of my secrets. I created a light box out of a uh, light therapy lamp uh, that was about 20 bucks, and then just created a nice little ledge to set the card on and a card cut out uh, out of a soda box. Uh, it, you don't have to spend a ton of money to have a very effective setup. Um, so magnification we know. We want to look at rosettes. We want to look at black ink. Does it have the correct black ink in the correct places? So let's go back to the microscope here. And let's take an example out of, let's see, something that I've authenticated on my Instagram page before, which is Mountain King Auth with underscores. So here we're going to look at this ancestral recall. This is fake. This is fake, fake, fake. And the way that you can tell is this is all rich black. Now, each color, as we learned when we stopped and watched that uh, video on misprintedmtg.com, um, each color goes through in a single pass. But you've also got simple black, which is kind of a uh, darker black. And you've got rich black, which is art black, essentially. Now this one, the black on the sides is all the same. Which, it's kind of funny, they also made it a point to have that little um, white triangle there to fool you into thinking that it has the double border. But, not fooling me, this actually came along because originally the first set, Wizards sent the images to Cardamundi with black borders already on the image assuming that Cardamundi would just put, you know, simple black over the borders. And here, that dot is because the image had a rounded corner. But what Cardamundi did was just put the image straight into the thing and then added their own black borders. And that's why you have this double black border. So down here, let's see, let me, there. Down here is the rich black, the art black, and you can see that there's um, bits of all the other colors coming through. And then up here, you've got simple black, which is just black black. And that's a good way to look very quickly and find out, is my alpha or beta card easily fake? Which, this one actually looks pretty good if you don't look too close at it, but this is all rich black. They didn't do... And you also see here in the uh, the shadows on the text. And then let's see, same thing with the text here. This is also a very good tell. The text should be dark, where if we look at my mountain here, the shadowing behind the text is solid. That's that simple black. And then we go down to the text box. The text should be solid. It's simple black. Um, so none of that is secret information. 
just stuff that if you understand how it's printed, well, now you know. Um, another comparison point, those little white dots are not on all alpha and beta. I'm sorry, they are on all, all alpha cards as far as I know. Check me on that. But they're not on all alpha and beta cards. So this one, this doesn't have that double black border. But this one is the, change my view. This is the C mountain, it's A, B, and C. The third basic land for each type was added in beta. And since they already knew the mistake that was made here, they were sent with new layouts. And so your C art for each basic land, as well as some of the other cards that were not uh, printed correctly or that were missed, uh, were sent corrected. So, for example, uh, Volcanic Island didn't make it into Alpha, um, so it won't have the little white corners. And I think there are a couple of other cards that I can't think of offhand, but that is, it's not a foolproof thing, but if you know about, educate yourself and keep, you can even keep notes, it's not even it's not a problem. Nobody's going to care if you have a list of things that are anomalies that you can refer to, but it's just some examples. So we've talked about the black ink test, and that's important. Um, there's also white spots, spots that are supposed to be white. Um, one of my favorite spots is the trademark line. The trademark line right there, if you look at it nice and close. Uh, it should have some actual kind of white in there, where a lot of a lot of times it doesn't quite look right on your face. Uh, let's go down the line. Um, let's talk about the bend test and the rip test. And by that I mean, let's never ever use the bend test and the rip test. There is a good reason behind this. There are plenty of fakes that will pass the bend test. And I think these will. Let's find out. I've got one pack of these here that I actually don't particularly care about. Let's use a card that I won't need to use as a reference again. Because I think these will probably pass the Ben test. Let's use this Kiki Jiki. This is one of the newer boxes of wish fakes that was thoughtfully donated to me. Um, right here. Uh, mostly passing the bend test. Um, and it's it's fine, it'll straighten out. Okay. Um, meanwhile, old cards like this very legitimate Volcanic Island uh, I don't know if this is the one, but one of my Volcanic Islands from Revised came from a smoking household. And I guarantee you, it would fail the bend test. It would just fold in half. Um, after cardboard has been exposed to smoke or um, moisture and just the open air after 20, 25 years, it'll pick things up. It'll become more brittle. So long story short, the Ben test is unreliable. Do not use it. It will damage legitimate cards, and it will give you false negatives on fake cards. Um, same with the RIP test, and let's talk about the RIP test for a second. I'm going to bring up my browser here. This is my, this is my Google Drive here. So what we want to look at, you don't need the rip test. What you see here is using my pocket microscope and a silly little device that I made by gluing half of a top loader to another top loader so that I can set a card in it 
upright, and I just smooth the edges so that I can get a good look at the blue core. It takes a very steady hand. <laughs> uh, but you can see here, this is, um, where'd they go? This is my, they're around here somewhere. Those are my polluted deltas. Hey there. back to my scene. This is my polluted deltas. One of these is real, one of these is, well, one, of, one is real and two are very fake. Um, this is the real one. You can see on the side here, simple black, solid line, and you notice how the ink gets absorbed into the card, especially in simple black. It's a nice thick layer. Here you can see the blue core. The blue core is a graphene laminate layer. It's essentially a glue. And how they're put together is you've got the backs and you've got the fronts. And um, <clears throat> oh, I wish I had pulled out my sheet. If you have one of those War of the Spark sheets, or if you have a, an uncut sheet from anywhere, you'll notice that, the, that they have the date printed on the front and the back. And they're different dates usually. They print out a bunch of backs, they print out a bunch of fronts. Now there's some exceptions, I'm sure, like um, your full art cards, which are cut slightly differently. But um, they use this blue laminate layer to glue the back to the front. And that's why you see this here. Um, now if we go to one of our fakes, this looks just like it's dyed. I'm not sure how this is made, but it looks like that's uninterrupted. Where on your legitimate one, you can tell this is two pieces glued together. And the same with our other fake. And you can also tell a couple of other things. You notice that the the ink isn't as thick here. That's probably because that one I believe uses uh, rich black all over instead of having black in two separate layers. And this one, you can see that the, the black layer on, on the back isn't nearly as thick. I mean, it's barely there. But again, this also just looks like it's a line of dye or something like that. Um, so it may not even be two, two layers. Or it could be that it is a laminate layer, but it's just not the right color, not the right, not the right type of uh, material, things like that. Anyway, back to just... Noticing that if you look very closely at real ones, you can see how they're supposed to look. Um, so that's that's the uh, blue core test, so that you don't have to uh, you don't have to rip, you don't have to bend. Um, the bend test was was originally conceived because new cards are supposed to be able to bend. Let's see if I have one. Maybe I don't. Here we go. We're supposed to be able to do that and then snap right back, sort of, kind of. But the problem is you do it more than once or twice in it and it may never come quite back right. And then the rip test, this is not an expensive card. The whole point there is to be able to see that blue core. But now that we know how to look for that blue core, we don't need this. Uh, let's move down to the next test, uh, light test. So we're just going to go to my handy dandy little Instagram here. If you don't follow me here, Mountain King Auth Entrepreneur, because you have to choose a category. Um, so let's look at. I think, uh, did I not? I don't know if I, I don't think I posted light test on this one. No, I posted light test on this one. So here, I go through a lot of this stuff. Uh, there we go. Let's look at light tests. Notice 
you can see the deck master box underneath. Let me see if I can get the box. Yeah, sure. Great. You can see this deck master box underneath. You can kind of vaguely see. Oh, I didn't I didn't change to the other. There we go. I'll have to cut this as well. Um, I'm on my Instagram here, Mountain King Off. Give me a follow. Now, this is a friend's card that I authenticated. I believe this might have been Caleb's. Um, black light test there. On most cards that aren't alternate fourth, if you have a card from the same set, it should show pretty similarly. Uh, but here we've got the light test. Down here you can see the deck master box. And then up above his head you can see the magic symbol. And you can see the gathering right on that little ziggurat there. And then from the back, now this one's in pretty rough shape, but it doesn't matter because what you need to see is just below the black and red dots there. You can see the text, sort of. This is also kind of another blue core test because the blue core will diffuse light just a little bit. So you can see that there is text there, but you can't always really tell exactly what it is. There is a kind of correct amount that you should be able to see uh, through the light test. Um, here is an example of a black lotus. Here, now different color of cards is a good example. Different colors of cards will show through differently. Now the, the text box of artifacts is pretty close to white, so you can see things a lot better through. And you can just almost read the text box, and you can see a bit of the lotus there through it. This is a beautiful example. Now if we go to uh, pictures, pictures that I just took and uploaded here to my Google Drive, um, this is my legitimate uh, polluted delta. That's kind of the same thing. You can tell that there is text there, but not quite what it is. That's one of the fake... Oh, I got them all out of order. Now, this has failed miserably. You barely see anything through there. Um, that's probably... as about as bad as you can fail the light test. This is the front of that one. Here's the front of my real one. Um, and since the art here is kind of light, and you can see the whole circle around that, not super clearly, but you can see that it's there, you can see the color. It helps that this polluted delta is kind of monotone. It's all kind of bluish and whitish. Um, and then here's one that doesn't do so well. You can see too much. Believe those are the cases. Um, just check here real quick. Yeah. yeah. So those are kind of two ways that you can fail the light test. Um, the front is a little more reliable to me. Um, but being able to see the text through the back. And again, it's not just that you can see something through it. You kind of have to spend some time comparing between legitimate ones and fakes to kind of see where it's coming. Um, now, you probably noticed these green dot tests here. And that's kind of the uh, elephant in the room that we're going to address now. Everywhere you go, on the counterfeit detection group, places like that. People tell you to post pictures of the green dot. Now, I'll go through these just to show some passes and some fails. So here's our legitimate.
card. And you've got a nice little kind of backwards L that shows under my, it's just using my pocket microscope and a 2x zoom of my phone camera. But it's a beautiful example. That's what you want. That's how you pass the, the green dot test. Here is a way to spectacularly fail the green dot test. Now, what this kind of tells me, and this is a, a regular thing that you see in counterfeits, the images come from somewhere. They come usually from scans of legitimate cards. But when you make a copy of a copy, it's a little less exact. Um, kind of like if you've, uh, if you've seen the, the lovely and kind of problematic movie Multiplicity starring Michael Keaton. Real funny. The copy of the copy isn't as sharp. Um, so this is the case where they took a scan and probably just fed it right into the printer and without doing any major editing or color, color correcting. Which is funny because in the back you should only have to do it once. Anyway, this is another way that you can spectacularly fail. There's no red. No red in the whole thing. That one was maybe overcorrected or it was not as good of a scan. In any case, that's basically the cop, the scan, then not going through quite right and having the right color balance. Um, the problem with this, let's discuss the problem with leaning on the on the green dot test. Now, the the spirit of the green dot test is pretty much correct because you want to compare to a known good copy. The problem with that, number one, regular variations. Uh, there are a number of sets where not all of the real cards actually have that L that we're looking at. So you're going to have false positives on fakes. Um, the other problem is that it's been something that the community has leaned on so hard for so long that I can basically guarantee you that this is the next thing that the, that the counterfeiters will start getting right. Because they'll know to color correct that. Because that's all anybody's going to look at. Now, how do we compensate for that? Well, don't just lean on this one spot. Understand how the printing process works. Understand your simple black versus dark, uh, versus rich black. Rather. Um, know how that's supposed to come across. Find different spots to compare. You can find the, the same spot on each card and compare them. Um, and know, you know, is the spot supposed to be rich black? Is the spot supposed to be simple black? Is the spot in the art the same from card to card? Not just card to card, but from the same set. If you're comparing a, an alpha card to a reprint from a recent set, obviously there's probably going to be some differences. Um, you know, cards that, that were reprinted in uh, Time Spiral with the old, old frame things like that. Um, anyway, the whole point is don't lean too hard on one test because if you do, that's just an invitation to uh, get fooled later. Also, you can look at this, uh, you, can, you can get more information from just, from this than just that there are four red dots. You can look and see that there are different angles um, to the half tones, and that's what makes that more our pattern. Um, so move on. Um, let's talk about some. Uh, let's see. Actually, I talked about it. Let's talk about some other ways that we are sometimes fooled. Um, thank you, polluted deltas. You've done your job. Uh, let's look at these two. Now these are both mountains. They look kind of similar and they're both missing a lot of magenta. This one 
I sun bleached in a west facing Oklahoma window over three summers. Most of the red is gone. This one is a jump start, not quite albino. Um, you can see even from here, there's still little splotches of red, but the fourth edition uh, redless mountains are a little too expensive for me. And I was able to get this one at a price that approached reasonable. So let's look at these under magnification because this is a very common question and we can just get it out of the way right now. Also kind of cool that you can see printing on my playmat. Anyway, so let's look at this mountain. Start at the M. Now this is a very, very thorough sun bleach. Like I said, over the course of three Oklahoma hot, hot summers, you can see a little uh, kind of greasy spots almost where there used to be red and yellow. Now, let's talk for a moment. Um, I'm going to go ahead and grab this site here. Could have done this better, but um, this is going to serve our purposes here. You can just Google light wavelengths. What's important to know is that your red is longer wavelengths, yellow is slightly shorter, blue is way shorter. Your longer wavelengths have uh, a shorter time to fade in the sun. So red and yellow, or magenta and yellow, will fade first because they're way over on that longer longer wavelength there. It has to do with how much energy it absorbs. Um, red is reflecting red back to you. Darker colors absorb more. Anyway, however it happens, those are the ones that fade first, and then your blue fades last, and black is generally pretty much unaffected. So let's go back to the microscope here. And we're looking and we're looking and we see I see some black I see some blue, and I see some spots that were probably blue and red together overlapping. And you can still see that kind of indigo color. And that's a good little hint to find your, all your sun bleach cards. Now, if they're not as thorough, they won't look this good. Now, in comparison, we look at this jumpstart albino. And boy howdy, we've got little, we've actually got spots of red all over here. And that is bright, vibrant red. And we've got little spots of blue that you can see up there. We've got little spots of yellow. And this tells us this was not sun faded. This is just ink that never was applied or didn't stick. So that's a good little exercise. Um, I love this spot down here in the mana symbol where you can kind of see what it was trying to do. So these aren't true albinos. These are very close though and good enough for me. So that's just a quick comparison on sun bleaches versus true cards that are missing ink.
Um, let's see. Some other things that you can look for. Um, the final test is kind of a, and maybe it's really the first test, this is a general impression test. What, what does something kind of look like overall? Are there any big glaring problems? So here's my real mana crypt. And here's a fake. So your general impression, the color is kind of wacky. Now the color is kind of more appropriate for newer cards. So it's, it's kind of anachronistic. Also notice up here, <laughs> they, this is one where I think they did, let's find out, I can find out real quick. This is a microscope. It looks, they actually applied the simple black, they corrected and applied simple black uh, borders. But, man, they, they did it sloppy because it's too low. <laughs> um, so really, I mean, the, the border is eating into the mana cost. Now, that's not to say that that hasn't happened legitimately before. I'm going to complicate this a little bit by bringing out this legitimate error, which this is a misprint. But this is kind of a known misprint from Destiny and Mercadian Masks. Um, where the text was out of place. But that shouldn't, that may not necessarily tell you that this is fake, but it should tell you I need to look closer at this. Um, and there's some other things with this card that, that will uh, kind of clue you in. The colors are not quite right, like all over, and it doesn't feel right. That's the last, one of the last little tests is some of them just don't feel right. Um, and that has to do with your wear coat. Now, regarding your wear coat, there's a few tests that kind of test that. Um, feel and reflection. So if we take a flashlight, it'll kind of give us a hint of how glossy that wear coat is. And they're kind of appropriate levels for gloss on a wear coat. And you should be able to even see it here. This one's just too glossy. Now, again, there is variation. Print shop to print shop. Uh, supplemental products. Um, the other thing is old cards. Like this is a fake. Fakeity, fake, fake. Um, this one you can see because it doesn't have the beveled edges. This is supposed to be revised. Well, we know that most revised had a very washed out kind of look. This is way too glossy for revised. There we go. Way too glossy even for mint revised. Now, this might be closer to appropriate for the foreign white bordered uh, German and Spanish and whatever else. Um, but the other thing is on old cards, as I had said earlier, after 20 years of being in the elements, smoke, moisture, things like that, um, that wear coat, and even through play, especially through play, that wear coat may not feel the same. So if it's very, very dull, Again, that may not be everything, because remember, one test doesn't do it. But it's very dull. You need to think to yourself, well, is this an old card? Is it played? Does it smell like anything? This one smells like fresh ink. It honestly smells like fresh ink. We know that's fake. Um... But little things like that, use your senses. Smell, touch, probably not taste. <laughs> uh, use magnification, use your tools. Uh, you can take measurements. Um, if you have a precision scale, you should absolutely use it. 
Um, you can use uh, one of the tools that I have is a precision thickness gauge. Um, but you can use something like this to tell exactly how thick something is and compare it with a similar card from a similar set. Variations are natural. Um, you will see variations within the set. You'll see variations after time specifically. Um, if you look back at my Instagram, we can go back to a couple of examples. Um, I think actually the Ancestral was a good example. Um, there were a couple of these that were a little bit damaged and ended up coming in underweight um, or overweight. You know, if oil or something was spilled on something, it may come in overweight. Oh, there, here we go. This one is uh, slightly underweight, likely due to damage and wear. So, again, comparison to real cards and thinking critically about what could have happened between now and then. Is it a brand new card? Is it a very old card? If it's mint, but very overweight and it's beta, um, we need to look at weight and thickness to make sure that it's not a reback. And not just thickness in one spot, but comparing thickness over several spots in the card. Um, and you can even look at, uh, you can look at the, uh, the magnification on the side for that as well. Oh, I just favorited my own post. <laughs> um, this blue line should be pretty much uninterrupted. Now, if you've got two parallel blue lines on a beta card, or if you've got spots where it's missing, then that may be a clue that you may be dealing with a reback. Is the back suspiciously mint? and the front's got a little bit of wear on it, it might be a reback. Are both sides suspiciously mint? Well, it might be a collector's edition reback. So it could be two legitimate cards that have been taken apart and glued back together to make a card that's not as it was printed by Wizards. So, um, Really, it's fraud <laughs> if it's represented as a real card. Um, otherwise, they're often sold as altars, um, which is still kind of sketchy. But um, anyway, that's just some more stuff to think about. Um, now, a conversation that comes up around this regularly, and I will only barely touch the surface. Um, this kind of brings up discussion of uh, accessibility and integrity. There's always a discussion about reserve list. These cards are so expensive. Is it right or is it not right to have counterfeits? Now, I will put my opinion out here. If you're going to use a proxy, use a proxy. There are plenty of places and that you can download a nice picture that makes it very clear that it's not an original authentic card. You can buy, you can even buy proxies from artists who make them, um, you know, the proxy guys, Patreon, and you get sent stuff that's very obviously not a legitimate Wizards of the Coast product. I really don't care when I see those. Um, but when I see these at the shop, especially when I see them in people's trade binders. Um, that's misrepresenting. Um, especially when I see fakes that people are playing in competitive tournaments. Um, there is an argument on game pieces should be made accessible. But there's also an argument about, and this is what kind of matters, is there is a social contract that you enter into 
that you're going to play legitimate game pieces unless you've discussed it otherwise. Anyway, not going to get too far into that, but that's something that's always brought up, so I wanted to make a quick nod to it. Um, personally, I have a lot of reserve list items. I wouldn't care if the reserve list was abolished, personally. And there's reasons for that. Look at the price of Beta Birds of Paradise. That card has been reprinted into Oblivion, and it's not even... I mean, it's casual superstar, kind of. But it's not that... I mean, it's a good card, but it's not like a staple and you don't have to run it in every green deck. Um, and I'll give you another example. Because I collect mountains... Now this... It's 4th edition mountain. The alt 4th mountain is worth maybe a buck. The regular 4th mountain is worth... Zero dollars. The 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 old fourth mountain is worth five thousand for three dollars. Um, conversely, this guy is now trending above three hundred bucks for a really nice shape. What's the difference? Rarity, prestige. So I'll just leave it with my argument on that. That if this guy can still be trending over three hundred bucks, your beta. Alpha, unlimited power, and things like that should be pretty resistant to reprint. Now, is that going to happen? Probably not. And that's the same discussion that we've had a million times. Um, pretty much it. So feel free to give me questions in the comments. Um, you can message me on Instagram. You can message me on uh, Twitter. I recently... <laughs> uh, so I've, I've got a, a Twitter that's my that's theoretically for magic, but I never use it. So you can get me at Bearded Skeptic on Twitter as well. Um, with questions, you can send me pictures of things and ask me if it's real. Uh, and if it is a tough case, I'll tell you that you need to give me money in and uh, send it to me. <laughs> but thanks for listening. I hope you've uh, gained some information, uh, maybe started on the path of getting some skills. Um, there's also another article on misprintedmtg.com um, with some links to... Uh, Jason's got basically the same USB microscope and handheld microscope and loop as I do. So you can follow those links or you can message me and ask me and I'll give you the links. Uh, this has been a very long video and I thank you for sticking with me. Um, if you have suggestions or requests on things that I should cover, please let me know. Um, if you enjoyed this, please give it a like. Consider doing a subscribe. Uh, I'm obviously not, I don't have YouTube voice, so <laughs> I'm not, I'm not doing this for, for the clout. Uh, this is just some information I wanted to get out. And again, uh, if you do have some high end or even some low end, anything that you want to get checked out, uh, authenticating, uh, so do trade intermediary. And, um, if you want to get things kind of, uh, pre-screened, then I'll give you my opinion on whether they should be graded or not. Um, thanks for joining. Uh, have a lovely day.